On the evening of Friday, April 20, 2012, the Solis family had a very pleasant time. Rebecca and Sergio's two sons played a baseball game in which their six-year-old sister, young Isabel, was present. The game lasted until 10 o'clock, after which the family returned home. The next morning, the girl was supposed to play baseball and Rebecca braided her hair so as not to waste time before work. At 11 o'clock, Sergio wished his daughter good night and left. Although Isabel had her own bedroom, she often slept in her brother's room. But on this particular night, she stayed alone. Soon, Becky and the boys went to sleep, and Sergio fell asleep on the couch, watching a baseball game he had recorded earlier. At five o'clock, the man woke up and slowly made his way to the bedroom. The house was quiet and peaceful when he went to sleep next to his wife. Two hours later, Rebecca left for work at the medical center. The woman didn't notice anything strange in the house and didn't hear anything. She didn't go into her daughter's room before leaving for work. At around 8 o'clock in the morning, Sergio went to wake his daughter up to go to the game, but Isabel was not in her bed. He asked his sons if they had seen their sister, but nobody responded. Together with the boys, he searched the house and called for Isabel, but there was no answer. Then, Sergio Jr., who was 14 years old at the time, noticed that the window in his sister's room was wide open, and the protective screen was lying on the ground in the yard. The husband called his wife. While Rebecca was racing home, and the sons were frantically searching the neighborhood for their younger sister, Sergio called the rescue service. This was the call that later sparked a lot of controversy and criticism towards him. People react differently in a state of stress or panic, but Sergio was surprisingly calm and collected during the call. Besides his calmness, it seemed strange to many that he immediately stated that his daughter had been kidnapped. He even laughed when he mentioned telling his wife to come home. Later, Sergio explained that he was simply trying to remain calm to provide the police with all the information they needed. Interestingly, the neighbor also called 911 on behalf of Sergio Jr. Unlike his father, he was shaking and clearly upset, but he also immediately stated that his sister had been kidnapped and they wouldn't find her. Then the phone was handed over to Rebecca, who had also been in a panic and despair when she arrived home. She was able to give a precise description of the clothing that her daughter was wearing before her disappearance. The arriving officers indeed found a protective screen on the bedroom window of the girl on the ground in the yard. There was a large hole in it, as if someone had used a tool to make it. Soft toys were always lying under the girl's window in the room, and now they were scattered in disorder. Blood was discovered on the floor next to Isabel. Shoe prints were found behind the house, on the alley and on the electrical box under the high fence of the family. Presumably, the perpetrator climbed over it when he abducted the girl. The police organized massive searches, going from door to door, believing it was a kidnapping case, rejecting the idea that the six-year-old girl could have run away. The neighbor of the Sellis family, Alicia Stardavant, said that she was woken up by a noise around 6.30 a.m. Her bedroom is literally across the fence from the girl's room. The girl said that she heard her dogs and the Celis family dogs barking. Besides them, she heard men's voices, seemingly on her side of the fence, not at the Celis family's home. But it was already getting light outside, and she didn't pay attention to it and fell asleep again. Alicia noted that the men did not lower their voices or whisper, and she didn't think for a second that there was also a small child there. The police set up a checkpoint around the Celis family's house and only allowed local residents through. The search initially focused on a small area around the house because in most cases, children are killed within a radius of 100 meters from the place of abduction. Then they expanded the search radius, included several apartment buildings, and interviewed residents. Officers checked the stadium where Isabel's baseball game was supposed to take place, the local garbage dump. The lakes and ponds were inspected with underwater cameras and sonars. Forensic experts and search dogs searched the Celis family's home, 
and border guards distributed photos of Isabel because when children go missing in Arizona, there is a high chance they end up on the other side of the border with Mexico. In addition, in 2012, 16 criminals who had committed violent acts against women and children lived near the family's home. All of them were interrogated and excluded at that time. A theory emerged that someone had noticed Isabel playing with her brothers in the evening, followed the family, and abducted the girl from the house at night. Following this lead, officers checked the registration numbers of all the cars in the parking lot. Surveillance video cameras located near the family's home showed an unusually active nightlife. At 2.36 am, a private security company's car appeared in the alley near the house, and two more cars were shown in the parking lot ten minutes later. Suddenly, a large number of pedestrians were wandering around the house, some of them interested in garbage cans, and an hour before the 911 call, a car quickly turned the corner near the trash can. But the girl did not appear anywhere in the 10 hours of filming. However, something interesting was discovered during the search of the house by the police. The officers found inscriptions on the door frame of Isabel's wardrobe. The inscriptions were written in a child's handwriting, and included such words as bad father, I don't love father, and bad day. Rebecca claimed she had no idea about this, but the police decided to interrogate Isabel's family more thoroughly. One of the sons revealed that when their father drank, he became aggressive, cursed, and hit him twice. Therefore, investigators invited employees of the Child Protection Services, concerned about the Solis sons. Especially since, as it turned out, Child Protection Services had been called to the family's home more than once. In January 2012, one of the boys was washing dishes and left a glass in the detergent. Sergio drank water from that glass and scolded his son for his mistake. Rebecca insists that they laughed about the incident. But the next day, the boy told his friends about it, and someone's parents contacted the Child Protection Services. Anyway, in May 2012, at their request, Sergio voluntarily left the house, although Rebecca claimed that her husband was an excellent father and when Isabel returned home, all questions would be answered. Although the incident was soon resolved, and Sergio was able to return home to his wife and sons, the family was upset that the investigation did not bring any results. Although the incident was soon resolved and Sergio was able to return home to his wife and children, the family was upset that the police continued to focus on them, especially Sergio, despite never being named a suspect. Later, the man stated, it feels like the investigation never went beyond this house. That's what's so upsetting. So they hired private detective Jerry Snyder to conduct an unbiased investigation into Isabel's abduction and his suspicions fell on Rebecca's cousin, Justin Mastromarino. At first, Justin acted as a representative of the family, constantly speaking to journalists and giving interviews. But within two weeks of Isabel's disappearance, he sent his car to Florida, hired the best lawyer, and left, refusing to answer reporters or police's questions. Such behavior seemed strange to the private detective. Moreover, Justin had lived in the Solis family's home for a long time and still had a key to the house. There was a version that Justin, who had previously stayed overnight in Isabel's room, could owe money to someone and the criminal came for him. But instead of Justin, he found Isabel in the room and took her for ransom or as leverage. On the other hand, his friend Sebastian Hartsfield is confident that Master Marino did the right thing, and if he had the means, he would have left too. The thing is, Justin was tired of the intrusive attention of the media and the public. Sebastian said that they spent the evening of the abduction together with Justin. He reluctantly admits that it was April 20th, National Cannabis Day, so he and Justin smoked and drank all evening. Although there was a six-hour gap when they were asleep, and he cannot say for sure where Justin was, Sebastian is confident in his friend's innocence. When the police finally questioned Justin, the police chief said that the investigator hired by the family had no evidence, but the police were absolutely sure of Justin's innocence. It is worth noting that Sergio was also suspected of owing money to bad people, 
and his daughter was kidnapped for ransom. Isabel was at the age when children are more often abducted by relatives. She was kidnapped from the house where only her relatives were present, and Sergio was the last person to see her, kissing her goodnight at 11 o'clock. He did not pass a polygraph test. Moreover, the fact that the dogs barked at night indirectly confirms the involvement of someone from the family. How could a stranger know where the girl's room was, that she wouldn't be sleeping in her brother's bedroom, and that there would be no dogs in her room? Usually, at least one of them slept in her bedroom. How could the kidnapper know exactly how to avoid the surveillance cameras located on the street? Yet, besides suspicion, there was nothing linking Sergio or Justin to the crime. Where was Isabel? Let's go back to the morning of July 23, 2012, when the rescue service received three distress calls. A child, a girl, called and said she wanted to report a kidnapping. She mentioned Isabel's name and said he's coming, identified the district where she was located, and then the call disconnected. The officers went to the specified district, but they didn't find anyone. They traced the call to an apartment building where two sisters, aged 9 and 11, lived. The sisters had simply decided to play a prank. The calls caused a lot of fuss, but they were quickly released. However, their joke cost the city $4,700 in officers' wages, spent on the search in the district specified by the girls. After this incident, the police tried several times to draw attention to the case, for example, by sharing an image of what Isabel might look like several years later. But despite all efforts, there was no progress in the case for years. Who kidnapped Isabel? Was it someone unknown to the family who entered through a window and took her? Did Justin consider kidnapping Isabel, because he was in debt and wanted to demand a ransom, but the kidnapping went wrong? Was one of her brothers involved in what happened to her, and are their relatives covering it up? Or does Isabel's biological father know more than he's saying? Unexpectedly, on February 8, 2017, there was a breakthrough in the case. A woman named Melissa contacted the FBI and stated that they should speak to her fiancé, Christopher Clements, about the disappearance of Isabel. Supposedly, he might know something about the girl's disappearance, but Melissa couldn't say anything more and they should talk to him. Finding Christopher proved to be quite easy. He was in jail on charges of robbery. Christopher confirmed to the agents that he knew where to find Isabel, but demanded a deal. In exchange for information about Isabel's whereabouts, he wants his charges dropped, his confiscated Acura Honda returned, and full immunity in Isabel's case. He assured them that he only knows what happened to the girl. It is also known to a member of the Celis family. He hinted that Sergio knew about the kidnapping of his daughter and was involved in it. Christopher told them that Sergio was seen handing over Mexican gold coins to someone at a local pawn shop. Supposedly, there was a fight and Isabel was taken to get the money that her father owed for the stolen coins. Christopher spoke very broadly, and no matter how much the agents questioned him, he didn't go into details. The man stood his ground, information in exchange for a deal. He got what he wanted. The prosecutor's office went for a deal, dropped the charges of robbery and returned the car. The man revealed where to find Isabel, and on March 3, 2017, the police and the FBI found her remains. Rebecca and Sergio Solis faced the grim confirmation that Isabel had left forever. Whatever dreams they had of a happy reunion were destroyed. However, the deal did not give Christopher Clements the desired freedom. Instead, he was transferred to the Maricopa County Jail, where he was charged with another robbery. The agreement did not provide full immunity, which Christopher insisted on in Isabel's case. Investigators began digging deeper into the man's past. He started his criminal career at the age of 16 by committing first-degree violence. Since then, he had repeatedly gotten into trouble. The man's ex-wife said that Christopher was obsessed with adult movies often brought girls from strip clubs home, and she was forced to sleep in the car until they left. And at the time of Isabel's disappearance, 
he worked at a shopping center only two kilometers away from her home. Undoubtedly, detectives checked Sergio's connection to the nearby pawn shop mentioned by Christopher. They found out that 21 gold coins were stolen from the woman's house two months before Isabel's abduction, and they believed that Christopher committed the theft. The surveillance camera captured him entering the pawn shop hours after the theft, delivering the goods, and receiving the money. The video did not suggest Sergio's involvement or any connection to the case. Most likely, Christopher was just studying the accusations against Sergio, which were mentioned in the press, and was talking to agents, trying to cast a shadow on the girl's father. The police received several search warrants, including one for the house where Christopher and his fiancée Melissa used to live. In one corner of the yard, investigators found a sheet of plywood under which was a plastic container containing ashes and several gruesome discoveries, including a faded lilac child's hoodie with a hood and a school assignment of a very young child with the name Mercedes on it. Her full name was Isabel Mercedes Tselis. They also found indecent photos of girls aged 3 to 13 on Christopher's devices. Searches on his computer included Isabel Tselis, unsolved cases in Arizona, and child killer acquitted. A former acquaintance of Christopher's, said he talked about the Isabel case and let slip that there might be evidence in the trunk of his car, so it was crucial to bring it back. The car was described as a Honda Acura that was returned to the man in exchange for information about Isabel's whereabouts. It is still unknown how Isabel died, but according to the same acquaintance, she was suffocated, and her body was doused with chemicals. The man remembered that Christopher showed him photos of the Tselis house that he had hidden in a Bible in his room. Investigators obtained a warrant for this Bible, and indeed found pictures of the house. Two months later, the Tucson police chief announced that they had a suspect, 36-year-old Christopher Clements, who had been charged with not one, but two murders. The thing is, on March 3, 2017, when Christopher described to agents the location where they would find Isabel, he mentioned an important marker, a pile of tires that clearly did not appear there in just one day. This instruction immediately alarmed the agents, because a few years ago, the police found the body of a teenage girl from Tucson near that same tire pile. The girl's name was Maribel Gonzalez. In June 2014, two years had passed since Isabel's disappearance, when a rescue service dispatcher answered a horrifying call. A woman reported a body she had noticed by the roadside. The police who arrived on the call found signs that someone had been dragged on the ground, the smell of decay and a naked body buried under the pile of tires. It was a location significantly distant from the nearest houses. The police shared with the media a photo of a chain with an anchor that the girl was wearing, as well as a tattoo on her collarbone, in hopes that the public would help identify her. Indeed, several people called the police saying that it was 13-year-old Maribel Gonzalez. Maribel's family said that she was seeing a 20-year-old man named Mariano. They had been together for three years but broke up a month before Maribel disappeared. Mariano told the police that she sent him a message around 11 to 12 p.m. on the day of her disappearance, asking him to pick her up because she had a fight with her mother. He ignored her message because he had to get up early for work. He never saw her again. Her boyfriend said that she loved to walk alone, even at night. She also liked to go to the mall, the same one near Isabel's house where Christopher Clements worked. The police linked these cases based on the fact that the bodies were found in close proximity to each other. Christopher's DNA was compared to the DNA found on Maribel, and it matched. Isabel was kidnapped and killed two years before Maribel. Could the perpetrator have been caught after the first crime and prevented Maribel's death? It turns out that Christopher's name came up during the investigation before his conversation with the agents in 2018, more than once. As it is already known, the officers contacted all individuals who committed sexual crimes and lived nearby Isabel, violent acts against women and children. The list contained 16 names, including Christopher. He was listed as a Class 3 offender, meaning with a very high likelihood of reoffending. The police talked to him, 
but obviously, he was able to convince the officer that he had nothing to do with the case. Perhaps his girlfriend provided him with an alibi. Furthermore, after Isabel's disappearance, her parents asked to recall any unexpected meetings, uninvited guests, traders, advertising agents, distributors, anyone who could arouse suspicion. Rebecca immediately remembered a man who was interested in their red Acura. He came twice, but the woman did not know his name, and he never entered the house. Interestingly, Christopher also mentioned that meeting during the interrogations. This is what he told FBI agents on February 10, 2017. According to him, two people pretended to be interested in the car. In fact, they needed to make sure that Sergio lived at that address. They approached Rebecca, and she gave them the phone number and said that they needed to talk about the possibility of buying from her husband Sergio. Thus, the men confirmed what they wanted. Christopher said that he just knew about this visit, but he himself never approached the Selesov's house. However, during the conversation, he several times referred to we instead of they, as if confessing that one of the men was him. Christopher's description of the visit coincides with Rebecca's story, except for one detail, the woman described only one man who matched Christopher's description and drove the same car as he did. But her description differs slightly from the description given by her husband. What if the police had followed this lead immediately after Isabel's disappearance? Would it have led them to Christopher Clements? Investigators believe that the kidnapping of Isabel was not spontaneous. Christopher had planned his crimes. He repeatedly called the home of the woman from whom he stole gold coins when she was not home. He also called the Sellis family home, as early as October 2011. The day after the kidnapping, Christopher changed his phone number and washed his car. If cleaning his car usually cost him around $10.35, this time he paid $110. However, changing his phone number did not help, as phone records linked Christopher to two crimes. Footprints found at the scene of Isabel's kidnapping matched sneakers that no one in the Sellis family wore, but which Christopher was often seen wearing, and even photographed in. Detectives also studied photos on his devices and found a miniature snapshot. It was a selfie of a man on the front seat of a car who looked like Clements, and a little girl lying on the back seat who was extremely similar to Isabel. The photo was shown to Sergio and Rebecca. The woman agreed that the girl resembled Isabel, but she could not say for sure because the image quality was terrible. Christopher claimed the child in the photo was his son. But when the photo was shown to Melissa, his fiancée, she began to shake. She did not recognize the child as her own. The child in the photo did not resemble the one-and-a-half-year-old fair-haired boy. Instead, it was more like a dark-haired girl with her hair braided, which Isabel's mother had done just before the kidnapping. The defense argued that the footprints were initially described as work boots, Christopher did not have his phone with him during those calls, and the blood in Isabel's bedroom probably appeared before the kidnapping. Christopher's lawyers successfully pushed for two separate trials, one for the Isabel case and one for the Maribel case, so that the prosecutor could not present evidence for both crimes at once. However, this did not help him much because he had already been found guilty of Maribel Gonzalez's murder. He still has to face trial for the kidnapping of Isabel.